your precious land. Educating your people is the golden key to maintain the success of this territory. Oh, how radiant are your daughters, and how wealthy are your sons. Your beaches boast your beauty, and your success is second to none. Green and brilliant are your hillsides, they replenish our hopes and pride. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands, your qualities can never be denied. May God richly bless this territory. May we ask three things of thee. Courage for all great leaders, that they may rule our destiny. We ask for wisdom for our people, that they may live in harmony. And understanding for our children, that they may cherish this legacy. Oh, how radiant are your daughters, and how wealthy are your sons. Your beaches boast your beauty, and your success is second to none. Green and brilliant are your hillsides, they replenish our hopes and pride. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands, your qualities can never be denied. Oh, beautiful Virgin Islands, your qualities can never be denied. Close the eyes, bow your heads, reverence to God. Almighty Father, through your precious Son, Jesus Christ, we come before you. As we are about to begin, as we are about to launch our Trust Fund, Climate Change, Trust Fund, Awareness Campaign, O oh God, I ask you, dear Father, that you will be with us, be with the ones who will be presented this afternoon. I pray, dear Lord, that you will reign prosperity upon this Trust Fund, O oh God. Monies will be showered from all over their father that we will not have to ask where the money is coming from but the money will be coming from you once we put our trust and our faith in you dear lord father we ask you dear, dear that you will be with this proceeding this afternoon and i ask you that at the end of this proceeding dear god we will re realize that climate change has been going on for years and this is no exception father be with us amen, amen. The format we're going to follow here this afternoon is we're going to have a few presentations um, followed by 30 minutes of questions from the media and then we'll wrap things up shortly after that. Um, I now call the Minister of Natural Resources and Labor, Dr. The Honorable Kedrick Pickering. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you greetings from the government and people of the Virgin Islands, and it is indeed an honor for me to stand here and address all of you on such an important topic. As Minister re with responsibility for the environment in the Virgin Islands, I continue in my endeavor to do my part to keep the issue of the environment at the forefront. The United Nations has declared this year as the International Year of Small Island Development States, and as a territory comprised of many small islands, it is projected that we face many challenges in terms of the effects of climate change. It is important that as stewards of this earth, of these islands and of these Virgin Islands in particular, we develop a framework that is grounded in sustainability. Reduction of pollution 
improve the efficiency in the use of energy and our natural resources and the adoption of healthier lifestyles and habits as some of the building blocks to a greener territory. Climate change is but one phenomenon that poses a great threat to the long-term development of our territory. Rising temperatures, sea level rise and stronger hurricanes will continue to impact our region. And experts have warned that the cost of climate change to the gross domestic product of small islands of the Caribbean will be among the highest worldwide. Unfortunately, while Caribbean countries contribute less than 0.1% to the global greenhouse gas emissions associated with climate change, they will be among the earliest and worst affected by this global phenomenon. Small islands have many inherent vulnerabilities that are exasperated by climate change. These include, for example, their small size, relative isolation, concentration of communities and infrastructure in coastal areas, narrow economic base, dependence on natural resources, susceptibility to narrow to shocks and their limited financial, technical and institutional capacity. Exposure to current weather related hazards and other climate variability compound these vulnerabilities which are oftentimes linked to inappropriate development paradigms. Recent studies have indicated that within 15 years, the costs of impacts from climate change in the Caribbean are likely to be in the range of 4.5% of the gross domestic product, which in real terms is approximately $50 million per year based on the 2010 GDP. And this is expected to rise up to 20% of GDP by 2100. So unless the Virgin Islands implements immediate and priority climate change, environmental and disaster risk management programs, climate change will have a significant impact on our economy in both the near and long term. With limited opportunity to access international climate change financing, the Virgin Islands has, with the assistance of the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, over the past years embarked upon a broad-based consultative process to develop a national climate change financing framework to implement urgent priority climate change and disaster management programs contained in the Virgin Islands Climate Change Adaptation Policy. This National Climate Change Financing Network, which is to be established under legislation and needs the highest international and meets the highest international standards of fiduciary management, is already being recognized as a potential model for other vulnerable island development states. The Climate Change Trust Fund envisage to support the implementation of the climate change policy will increasingly assist the territory and its citizens in adapting and mitigating against the foreseen impacts of climate change. The tangible benefits to our territory will accrue as a result of future access that private and public sector organizations and citizens will have to the fund in order to support the attainment of the goals and objectives of the policy. This climate change awareness campaign ultimately serves to raise public consciousness to promote understanding of essential linkages between the preservation of the environment and the development of our territory. I think that is worth repeating, that this climate change awareness campaign ultimately serves to raise public consciousness to promote understanding of the essential linkages between the preservation of the environment and the development of our territory. It was formed specifically to sensitize members of the public to the growing environmental, developmental, economical, and health-related concerns surrounding the effects of climate change that the Virgin Islands will nonetheless experience. And so we will continue to place heavy emphasis 
on climate change, and this campaign is intended to stretch way into the month of June when we celebrate Environmental Month. Activities for the campaign include several presentations and meetings in civic groups and schools. And all persons are encouraged to come and view the Climate Change Trust Fund exhibit to be held during the week of May 19th to 23rd here at the admin complex in the lobby of the East Wing. The campaign will also include several messages on the local radio stations as well as through the government information service and the local television. At the ministry, we would like persons to take advantage of our hashtag for this campaign in the social media so that if you have a comment please tweet or retweet us at BVI government on Twitter or Facebook the comment using the hashtag dash BVI climate your questions and comments are valuable as we do our best to raise the profile of the environment. I continue to promote the idea of us all understanding the value of our environment. We take care of the things that we value and so the more we value the environment is the more emphasis that we will place on protecting it. And I continue to add that in the context of the BVI's economy where tourism is vitally important for our survival that there is no tourism without the environment. The actor Robert Redford once said, and I quote, that, that I think the environment should be put in the category of our national security. Defense of our resources is just as important as defense abroad. Otherwise, what is there to defend? Unquote. And so I'll remind each of us to be defenders of the environment, of our territory, of these beautiful Virgin Islands. I again want to thank all the persons within the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor and the Conservation and Fisheries Department for all their hard work in putting this event together, for the work being done on planning and executing of the campaign in an effort to keep the public informed. I thank you for listening. God bless you and God continue to bless these Virgin Islands. Thank you very much. Thank you for those remarks. I think Dr. Trotz has been to the BVI several times. So all of us should know um, Dr. Trotz. But anyway, I'll do a little brief introduction of um, Dr. Trotz for us. A scientist by training, Dr. Trotz commenced his university education in Edinburgh and attained his doctorate in organic chemistry in Toronto, Canada. His career experiences and achievements are wide and varied. He has worked as director of science and technology and division um, to the Commonwealth Secretariat as the Commonwealth Science Council and Science Advisor to the Commonwealth Secretariat as well. He also served as Secretary General for the National Science Research Council of Guyana. He served as Dean and Faculty of the National Science University of Guyana. He was Director of the Institute of Applied Sciences and Technology in Guyana as well. Since 1997, Dr. Trotz in his capacity as Manager for the Jeff funded CPAC and, and MAC project and the CID-funded ACC project has been given directions to the region's effort to build capacity for climate change adaptation. Dr. Trotz was a reviewer for the edit for chap um, chapter 16 on SIDS in the fourth assessment report of I IPCC. He has presented several papers and lectures at a range of regional and international fora on climate change issues. Dr. Trotz currently holds the post of Deputy Director of science and advisor in the recently established five C's, which we know as the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. Dr. Trotz. Chairman, Deputy Prime Minister, Dr. Pickering, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here this afternoon for this occasion. I bring you greetings from the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, which is an institution which was established by heads of government of the CARICOM community uh, in 2002. We started to be operational in 2005, and our role, our mandate, basically is to help our region to meet the challenge of what has emerged 
as a major developmental uh, problem, climate change. Over the years, we've been working throughout the Caribbean, helping countries to identify the climate risks that they would be exposed to, the vulnerabilities, and basically programs for response. We were funded by the Department for International Development, uh, the UK Department uh, for International Development, to carry out that same work in the overseas territories. And for the last few years, we worked here in the BVI to carry out vulnerability and capacity assessments, to discuss with several stakeholders their exposure to climate risk, and to agree on a program for responding to those climate risks. As a result, you now have in the BVI a, a, a plan, a, a climate change plan, uh, we call it the adaptation policy, how to respond, but you have that, it's a cabinet approved document, so it's an official document, and part of that uh, plan is establishment of the trust fund, which will be a source of finance to help the country to address the challenges that we see ahead. We have been, we at the center have been very encouraged by the response and by the very professional inputs that we've had here during our work. In fact, I can share a secret with you. For each country, we go in and we do what is known as a vulnerability and capacity assessment. We did it here for the tourism sector, and it was so thorough and so well uh, uh, researched that it is now held up in the region as a model VCA, and we are using that to encourage other countries to apply that same thoroughness, that same professionalism to the exer exercise. We look forward to working with the BVI in future to ensure that the policy that we have agreed to will be implemented for the benefit of the people of the British Virgin Islands. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trotz. And in saying that, uh, he mentioned about the vulnerability and capacity um, assessment that was done right here in the, um, in the Virgin Islands. It goes to show you that sometimes right in our own territory we have expertise because that was done um, by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor and Conservation and Fisheries um, Department with the lead agent or uh, individual being Ms. Angela Burnett Penn. And she did an excellent work on that paper. And as you can see, it's now being used as a model, as a model throughout the Caribbean. So you can see a lot of times we have the expertise right within our countries to do things. Next, we're going to have Mr. George DeBert Romali. Who has over 25 years experience as an environmental lawyer and legal draftman working with governments in 45 countries in the Caribbean, the Pacific, Indian Ocean, Africa, and Asia regions in the establishment of policies and laws to implement a variety of international environmental conventions. For the past 15 years, he has provided policy advice and technical um, support to governments in vulnerable countries in the development of climate change risk management strategies and projects funded by a number of international agencies. He is a member of the roster of experts for climate change establishment by several international agencies, including the scientific and Technical Advisory Panel, which is strapped to the Global Environmental Facility, GEF, to the Climate Change, to the Climate Investment Fund, CIF, and the Australia Agency for International Development. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you George DeBert Romali. Hello, Deputy Premier, distinguished guests, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be back here. I come from Canada where I live at the moment and uh, we still have uh, some severe winter weather up there so it's very pleased to come back here and enjoy the wonderful weather you're having here. We're very much pleased to be able to participate with you this afternoon on behalf of the Climate Change Centre and to continue the support we've been providing to the British Virgin Islands in this very important development. 
Over the years, as you've heard, we've been working with uh, various representatives from government um, to develop both the climate change uh, adaptation policy and also to put in place the mechanisms, the Climate Change Trust Fund, to provide funding for that particular policy. This is in line with a lot of developments which are currently undergo at the International Forum. Under the Climate Change Convention, there is a recognition that because of the inability for the uh, polluting nations who are causing a lot of the greenhouse gases to come together and agree on how to uh, reduce the emissions, the likelihood is that we're going to see uh, increases in um, global average temperatures which are going to cause some severe impacts for particularly vulnerable countries such as the small island states. It's very important then that we provide resources and support to those vulnerable countries such as the Virgin Islands uh, to put in place the measures to address these risks. And that's where the climate change adaptation policy um, is really focused, to try and identify what your priorities are, what your needs, and more importantly how you as a country can go forward to address these risks. Attend upon that is obviously the fact there needs to be some new financing for this. There's a new measures that need to be put in place, new activities need to be funded, and Clearly this is outside the capacity of many governments around the world, let alone small territories such as, as the, the British Virgin Islands. This recognition has been reflected more recently in the discussions at the international uh, negotiations level. Under the Climate Change Convention, there is recognition that because we are not able to reduce the greenhouse gases uh, to the levels that are required to prevent um, severe impacts to vulnerable countries, that there is a need for the industrialized nations who are causing this pollution to make available financing so that vulnerable countries such as the British Virgin Islands can have access to financing needed to put in place these measures to address the risks. And that's very much where we are supporting uh, the process and we're very pleased that uh, the British Virgin Islands is certainly taking the lead in this regard in this region in not only having a policy approved by uh, cabinet, but more importantly, putting in place the financial mechanisms, the Climate Change Trust Fund, to implement and finance those urgent priority measures. This, as I said, is very much in keeping with the discussions at the international level, where the global community has committed to providing $100 billion in financing, climate change financing, by the year 2020, to help vulnerable countries such as the Virgin Islands address the impacts from climate change. The key for the access to such funding is obviously to get your own house in order. That means you have to have a policy which identifies the measures that you consider urgent and priority to address the risks and also a mechanism so you can access the financing and spend that financing on implementing those priority measures. And this is very much the work we've been supporting, very pleased to support uh, from the Climate Change Center's point of view. And we're also very pleased that the development of the proposed Climate Change Trust Fund uh, and the Act which is going to put in place has been uh, championed very much by the, the Ministry represented by, by the uh, Minister this afternoon, uh, but has a lot of support from other stakeholders, uh, a number of other government departments, uh, private sector, civil society, recognize the need for such a trust fund and the need to get access financing. So over a period of about two years, we have been developing the architecture for this trust fund, how it's going to operate, how to make sure it meets international standards for fiduciary management, also meets the highest uh, standards as far as uh, transparency and accountability, and the, in the confidence that we will be able to access some of the climate change financing which is coming on stream from the international community. I should also uh, uh, comment on some of the earlier remarks made by my colleague Dr. Trotz. Uh, the, the Virgin Islands is certainly leading this um, development in developing national climate change financing. The trust fund legislation, which is hopefully presented to Cabinet shortly, will be the first amongst uh, the small states in this region to develop such a legislation. Um, and it is already being regarded as a model for other small island states and developing countries around the world. I've just finished doing some work in the Pacific and they're very interested in developments of what's happening with your your policy here, your climate change uh, adaptation policy and the Climate Change Trust Fund and certainly very eager to follow uh, in your footsteps to see how they could do the similar things in their own countries because there was a need to 
access the financing to put these uh, urgent measures in place. We do see that the trust fund is not only going to deal with climate change risk, but it also is going to provide an avenue for financing for the private sector, the tourism sector, to position it, uh, the, the sectors as a low carbon um, business opportunity. We see that energy costs are very high in the Virgin Islands and we see the trust fund as funding measures for the private sector, civil society and various others to put energy conversions in place, renewable energy measures in place um, and access the fund to help vulnerable communities deal not only with the high energy costs but also the risk they're facing from climate change generally. So we see this as a very important mechanism to deal with the needs of civil society, the private sector and communities. And we're very pleased that the, the Climate Change Centre has been able to associate and work with uh, the, the Virgin Islands in moving forward on this very important initiative. I thank you for the time to participate with you and uh, thank you much for, for uh, spending time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. We will now have 30 minutes of question and answers. I see Ms. Fenty with the mic, so if any of you guys have questions, the panel will be able to address them. Thank you. Good afternoon. Sean Rose, JTG News. Uh, Dr. Trott, you indicated that a VIA was done right here in the BVI recently. Could you share with us some of the key findings of that vulnerability impact assessment? Yes, well, for one thing, uh, you know that uh, our communities in the Caribbean are very coastal communities. And we are going to be exposed to sea level rise, uh, which translates into significant storm surge during hurricanes. Uh, we have evidence that already we are seeing that evidence in the region of the changing weather patterns. That you're getting rain when you don't expect it. You're getting a drought when you don't expect it. As a matter of fact, this year is projected to be a severe El Nino year, which brings severe drought conditions to the Caribbean. So your water uh, is a critical uh, commodity. And like the other Caribbean islands, we are all going to be exposed to a warmer and a drier Caribbean, putting further pressure on our water supplies. Uh, with sea level rise also, we are seeing salinization or intrusion of salt water into the aquifers. So these, will, the, these impacts will be serious uh, as, as, we, as we move along. Uh, we are projecting more intense hurricanes. The jury is still out on the question of uh, the frequency, but certainly if you remember Sandy uh, in, in New York, and the more recent uh, hurricane in the Philippines, you see the severity of, of the storms that we are now uh, experiencing. Recently, as recently as Christmas Eve last year, uh, three of our islands in the Caribbean, in the OECS, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, St. Lucia, and, uh, and Grena Dominica. No, Dominica. Dominica. Dominica, they, on Christmas Eve day, they had an extreme weather event. It wasn't a hurricane. It was just heavy rainfall, heavy precipitation that translated into landslides, loss of life, uh, loss, of, uh, loss of business, uh, disruption of services. So these are the patterns that we are now seeing in the region. And we are all vulnerable to these impacts. The tourist industry, for instance, depends on the pristine condition of your environment, your coral reefs for dive tourism, for instance. Uh, what we are seeing in the Caribbean is that with the, the rise in global temperatures, we're getting a rise in sea level uh, temperatures, which translates into bleaching of our coral reefs. Now, this will have serious consequences for the Caribbean. 
not only from the tourism point of view, is that we're losing a natural attraction, but the reefs happen to be a, a habitat for fisheries. And in the region, again, uh, the highest intake uh, or protein intake comes from the marine environment. If we lose our fish stocks, that will have some negative influence on our food security and the nutritional integrity of our people. Not only that, more frightening are some results that are coming out globally to show fish stocks migrating from warmer seas to cooler seas. So like our people in the Caribbean, our fish are migrating northwards. And this is another serious issue that we have to face. So as far as your concern here, like the rest of the region, uh, your, your food security is at risk, water resources are at risk, their impacts on health, uh, there is now, you know, some linkages between changing weather patterns and increased incidence of dengue. Uh, the, the, the tourism sector particularly is very vulnerable. A lot of their stock uh, is along the coast there in, in vulnerable areas. So uh, this is why we say it's no longer a simple environmental problem, but a serious developmental challenge where, as a result of these events, funds that are earmarked for development have to be diverted to dealing with some of the destruction that we are seeing as a result of living in a Caribbean where the climate is changing. Good afternoon, Gordon French, Greenville Platinum. Um, in relation to the climate change adaptation program at the Virgin Islands as and the setting up of this fund, I want to know what uh, has there been any cost analysis as to what the BVI will need to, to cover that program? Yes, good afternoon. Part of the work we've been doing um, in developing both the adaptation policy and the climate change trust fund uh, and this legislation to support it is to look at the financing needs. This is very important. We have estimates from um, very, very distinguished uh, economists around the world. Um, Sir Nicholas Stern was one of the first ones who's indicated that there is uh, significant impacts on GDP. And he attempted to quantify this by doing uh, assessments um, at a regional level. And the indications were obviously that the longer one country's uh, delay in putting measures in place, the more the cost is going to be, which is the real measure of, of the, uh, the, the, the message that he wanted to convey. Since that time, a number of other universities and economists have been doing further work. Um, in the Pacific, very recently, the World Bank has done an assessment and indicated that the small island developing states are the most vulnerable. And although the impacts and costs will vary depending upon their situation and, and stage of development, that the costs are likely to be in the range of uh, between 7.5 and as much as 20% of GDP. If we look at this uh, in the context of the Virgin Islands, our estimates have been, and this is based on some work done by the Stockholm Institute, that the Virgin Islands is going to need about $50 million a year to deal with these issues. And that is in the short term. The longer we delay, the more the costs are going to go up. So this is very much the, the basis from which uh, we are trying to establish the, the trust fund. We recognize that it is totally unrealistic to expect that the Virgin Islands could raise this new additional $50 million uh, from existing resources. So there's a need to try and find how best we can raise these resources. But there's also a commitment from the international community to finance the incremental costs associated with climate change. So we do anticipate it that once the trust fund is up and running, and hopefully we can generate some revenues from, from various sources, uh, that there will be contributions from the international community to pay for the incremental costs. Uh, we hope that it will be to, to come close to the $50 million which is needed, um, but that certainly uh, depend upon how well the trust fund shows that it can work efficiently uh, in a transparent and open manner and actually deliver the projects and activities on the ground to show the international community that this is something they should invest in. So that's our expectations. But those are the kind of figures that we've been looking at um, and trying to see how best we can uh, um, 
deal with the gap between what is needed and basically what, what funding is, is going to be available in the short term. Um, Honorable Dr. Pickering, can you say what government has been doing specifically in terms of human resources need to implement this fund and implement the program? Well, you, you'd have heard earlier that this, this has been a, a project jointly between the ministry itself, the staff of the ministry, and the Department of Conservation and Fisheries. And so we have dedicated officers that work between the department and the ministry, working on, who have worked both on the policy itself and are now working diligently on the getting the legislation in its proper form ready for submission to cabinet. It's an ongoing process. The two gentlemen sitting with us today are the consultants on the project, but the bulk of the work, hard work, the donkey work, so to speak, is being done by the officers in both the ministry and at, in the Department of Conservation and Fisheries. Good afternoon. Crystal Panic from the BBI Beacon newspaper. Um, we heard a little bit about um, energy changeover and transition to renewables. What other purposes might the fund go for specifically on the ground? What other? What, what other specific uses might the fund go for on the ground? Uh, let me, uh, the energy question is so important that I have to deal with that. Uh, I, we think that uh, there's a great opportunity now throughout the region for, for us to address the architecture of our energy sector. A few years ago there was a spike in oil prices, I think it was 2008. And some of our countries in the Caribbean had to outlay as much as 50 to 60 percent of their foreign exchange earnings to buy fossil fuel. As a region, we are designated as one of the most carbon intensive regions in the world, which means for each unit output of GDP, our energy costs are exceedingly high, which makes us uncompetitive in everything we do, manufacturing, or service industries or tourism industries, the energy input into the tourism industry for accommodation, transportation, etc., is high. And as a result, we are not competitive. So under the umbrella of uh, our discussions with climate change, we talk about adaptation, which is what you're asking about. Uh, when you deal with the energy cutting down the use of fossil fuels, you talk about uh, mitigation. Uh, there's a great opportunity for us to change that ar architecture, to start using more solar energy, more geothermal energy, more wind energy. And uh, they, there is a push globally now to help countries to transform their energy sector. For us, not because of any morality that says we want to take out the 0.1% that we put into the atmosphere, but it's a question of survival. The other actions, of course, uh, let's take the projections that we have for stronger hurricanes. Our building cones designed so that build, our buildings will be able to resist that. Uh, let us take the fact that, uh, you know, we've cut down our mangroves and we put development where it shouldn't be. Uh, we have to look at opportunities for restoring the natural environment, and I'm delighted when I go along the coast here. The few minutes I get away from uh, the ministry when I come to BVI to see that you're making an attempt to replant uh, mangroves. With water, uh, if you look at the agricultural sector, we have to worry about the use of the resource in, in, in the sector. And so we are introducing uh, new ways of irrigation, drip irrigation. We are looking at uh, more controlled uh, agriculture in greenhouses, etc. Basically, to have a more controlled environment where you can control the water uh, and other input into it. Uh, there, there, there is uh, there is another lesson that we learn, uh, just like people. The stronger your immune system is, the more likely it would be able to resist new infection, diseases, etc. 
and we can extend that type of thinking to our natural ecosystems, our mangroves, our sea, sea grass beds, our coral reefs. The healthier they are, the better, they, the better chance they have to resist uh, climate change impacts. So all the things we've been talking about, about land-based sources of pollution, preventing that from going into the lagoon, proper sewage treatment, basically zoning and ensuring that uh, we don't build in vulnerable areas, uh, looking at how you utilize the reefs, etc., putting value to those ecosystem services, and in a sense implementing rules and regulations that we already have in the statute books but aren't being enforced. So these are a lot of options and of course in the final analysis our own behavior with the way how we use our natural resources, the way how we use water, the way how we use uh, our energy. So there are a whole set of actions that are outlined in the uh, policy uh, paper which are essential if we're going to cope with the with the threats of climate change. Let me just add a couple of things to what Dr. Charts had said. You probably recall the Caribbean Challenge Initiative, which was held on Neck Island last year, May. Coming out of the CCI, there were three main issues that Caribbean countries will commit to the conservation of 20% of the near shore environment by 2020, that all Caribbean governments would put matters, put issues in place to convert from using fossil fuels to using renewable energy, and that Caribbean countries will implement the necessary legal framework to protect sharks and rays. Subsequent to CCI, in February of this year held on Mosquito Island was the Caribbean Wealth Summit in which the focus was primarily on the whole issue of renewable energies and the conversion of using fossil fuels to using alternative energy sources. And that summit focused on bringing together major players who are energy suppliers, utility users, the technical individuals, people who are involved in the major industries throughout the Caribbean. And up to $300 million have been identified by the private sector that will be made available to Caribbean governments, especially those signing on to the, the Mosquito Challenge and the, the, the summit outcomes. It now is left for the various governments to put in place those efforts that are necessary to make these issues become a reality. The BVI is working diligently to move along these paths. And so our Climate Change Trust Fund will put us in, in a very unique and advantageous position because a couple of weeks ago it was announced by the donor countries that $4.3 billion have been made available for the whole issue of, of, of climate change mitigation. And as, as my friends here would tell you who are better versed on these issues, that one of the really big issues facing, especially smaller countries, is how to access the funds. You've got to have a mechanism in place to be able to access the money. So the money is available, but nobody's going to write a check and say, take it, run, go, and go to, the, go to have a party. That's what the Climate Change Trust Fund is, a mechanism by which we will then be able to access that funding. And alongside accessing the funding will be the ability for us to work diligently to implement the factors involved in the climate change policy, one of which, of course, has to do with the whole question of renewable energy and the conversion factors therein. If I could just add one more thing. One of the key things we see from the ability to access this funding and provide for these new important measures is the investment in perhaps the most important resource, which is the human resource. We anticipate the fund will go towards training for people to be able to do 
a lot of work that is needed to manage the risks, to convert to a green economy, to help reduce energy costs, to help reduce the impacts of climate change. This is a significant investment, and we do anticipate that the trust fund will spend a considerable amount of money in um, training people so they're well positioned to deal with the opportunities provided by this uh, mechanism which will support the transition to a green economy. Dr. Perkin, if I may clarify, I know the government has been big on implementing renewable energy. Um, just from a policy perspective, is there a ministry spearheading that, that, that move now or is it a, a broad based approach? And, and that's a very good question and a very timely one also because one of the things that we've been working diligently at is the very point that was just made about the development of our human resource capacity. And one of the things that we have identified within the government is that we need a coordinator to be able to, to, to help with the implementation phase of these various initiatives. For example, as it exists right now, the Ministry of Health is responsible for the whole waste energy program. The Ministry of Communication and Works is responsible for the generation of, of, of electricity and is primarily responsible for the energy policy of the government. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor is the, is the, the arm of government that is responsible for the climate change and, and the issues associated with climate change. And so with all the, the, the various components that are involved in the, 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 the issues that we're discussing, we, uh, we have come to the point where we realize we need, in, in the very near future, at least one person who's doing the coordination, and probably it might evolve to being a very department in its own right because of the volume of work. And we've already identified Mr. Henry Quickie, who is the deputy manager of the electricity cooperation to take up that position and it's just the administrative aspects of it and he should be housed in, in the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor just for convenience and help to coordinate all these other activities that will ultimately lead to the country being able to, to, to convert from fossil fuels to alternative energy. Deputy Premier, could you give us a time frame if there is any at this point that you're looking forward to having this particular initiative come on stream, uh, including, of course, the, the required legislation? With respect to the legislation, I've said to our consultants, as soon as they're happy that it is in the, in the right legal framework for it to be advanced, then it is, it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor to advance it to Cabinet. Once it is advanced to Cabinet, that's a major hurdle for the legislation to go through the process. Then it will go to the House for debate and ultimately passage. Now, I can't give a specific timeline. It depends on when the legislation is handed to us and it goes through because it, it, when it's handed to us, it still has to have comments from relevant government departments. And so the process is something that we don't necessarily have control over. But I would hasten to say that I would expect by the end of the year that this legislation would be would be implemented. With respect to the to the movement of, of Mr. Crickey, we had expected that that would have happened already. And uh, it's 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 just a matter of getting, you know, the, the, the various smaller issues sorted out for him to finally transfer. And again, I can't tell you it will happen tomorrow or next week because I really expected it would have happened already. And again sir, with projects like the cruise ship care development and other uh, sea, uh, coastal based projects being embarked on in the territory, taking into consideration rising sea levels as a result of climate change. Any red flags, any lessons, uh, warning signs coming out of that report that would really change the face pretty much of coastal development in the territory? Oh, absolutely, because as you heard Dr. Trott just so eloquently spoke, he said that, that the more of the matters, the more of the factors that we have to mitigate against climate change is the better off we'd be. And you specifically the issue of replanting of the mangroves. So there, there are any number of issues that, that, that we don't destroy the, the, the sea grass, that we ensure that our coral reefs are protected. One of the things, for instance, that we're working on in the ministry 
and, I, and I've spoken about this in the house, is we are embarking on a program right now to remove ghost traps from the oceans and around our reef because the studies have shown that one of the one of the most important factors in protecting coral reefs is the parrot fish because the parrot fish because of, 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 of its life cycle feeds on the reef and helps to protect it the, the, the coral's um, life cycle and overfishing of the parrot fish is one of those factors that have led to the destruction of coral reefs and so we are working on a, 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 a project right now to help remove those traps that have been sitting in the ocean probably for years that are not biodegradable that ultimately we, we expect will help to replenish our fish stocks and um, if that project hasn't started already it should, it should be well on its way because it was just getting the contracts signed with the relevant parties to advance it so those are the sorts of issues that are critical ensuring that what, 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 what factors need to be in place to mitigate against climate change or actually in place and that's why the whole question of renewable energy is so vitally important because in, 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 in reducing greenhouse gas emission you still have to provide energy so it's, it's a, a multi-pronged approach. Could I uh, add to the DPM uh, from another perspective and this is from the perspective of the developer uh, what happens usually when you do design for coastal infrastructure, etc.? You consult uh, the literature for historical data on tides and uh, currents, etc. Now, all these things are projected to change. And what we're trying to drill into to planners and developers is that in designing any coastal infrastructure, looking at historical climate data isn't enough. You have to look at some projections of what future climate will mean for the coastal environment. And to that end, the center, we have a network. We've been doing climate modeling, looking at what the future holds in terms of climate parameters in the Caribbean. This is now available uh, through our website, so we are encouraging architects, anybody who is concerned with, with building on the coast to start to learn to use those projections to feed into their uh, design. Dr. Chot, some, some may say that these changes will take uh, a pretty long time and, and we, we may not need to worry ourselves about them in the immediate future. No, uh, that has been one of our big challenges in the climate change arena. Because we go and we talk about time slices that talk about 2080 and 2100. But the reality is that we are seeing changes right now with the climate. And now, for instance, we're talking about 2020 and 2035. And a lot of coastal infrastructure, their life cycle basically falls within the ambit of that, uh, of that time, time uh, span. So uh, we feel that climate change is no longer an issue for the future, uh, that we are dealing right now with a change in climate uh, in the Caribbean. And the evidence is all around us. Uh, so it's, it's something. And the other argument is that, as my colleague said earlier, uh, Stain's uh, uh, study showed that the longer you delayed to implement, the more costly it will be. So we, it's really incumbent on us to act now. Thank you. Uh, any other question? One more? Yes, just, um, can you elaborate on the need for collaboration with other sectors in society? The climate change adaptation um, process may be spearheaded by a particular ministry, but what thought, what consideration is being given to collaboration with, say, disaster management, that um, climate change adaptation is a very important uh, mitigation aspect for disaster managers. So what level of collaboration uh, should there be when we consider climate change adaptation for the region? Well, well, that is, that has, has been done. I mean, the, to get to the stage of 
producing the policy it took about four or five years. And part of the process was the whole collaboration and the number of, of meetings that were held with the various sectors that ultimately be affected. When you read the introduction to the climate change policy, it speaks specifically to that aspect. And within the, the ambit of the, the policy, it gives a clear outline here of exactly all the various sectors that are likely to be affected. And I could start from the bottom up and it talks about water resources, talks about tourism, insurance and banking, human health, forestry and biodiversity, food security and fisheries, food security and agriculture, energy security, human settlements, critical infrastructure, coastal and marine ecosystems, beach shoreline stability. So within the, 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 the confines of each one of those that are outlined are the various individual sectors within those sectors that have been involved in being able to come up with this this policy as it is. Perhaps I can just elaborate on that. The process in developing the policy itself um, by necessity must involve a broad stakeholder consultation. So that was undertaken uh, consultations with not only the sectors that the Deputy uh, Premier has indicated but also with civil society, community groups, uh, non-government organizations, academia. Um, it was spearheaded by a multi-sector climate change committee and that um, process of consultation is entrenched in the proposed Climate Change Trust Fund Act as well. So we have consultations um, uh, as part of the process to develop the policy, but also the representation on the Board of Trustees is very broad-based, involves civil society. Um, the Climate Change Committee uh, is broad-based, represents various sectors. And the technical working groups, again, represents all these sectors because climate change is not um, and cannot be dealt with by one ministry or one, uh, one uh, sector of government or even government on its own. They must work with civil society, must work with academia to provide the science that we need for informed decision making. We must work with community groups because they're on the front line with individuals uh, because they again are the ones that have to deal with the family issues of um, uh, lost housing or increased costs or no insurance which are the very real uh, elements of uh, dealing with the climate change issues. So, this philosophy of continued engagement with broad spectrum of society really is enshrined not only in the policy but also in the work going forward on the work of the Climate Change Trust Fund and being set up. Uh, uh, just, just uh, you mentioned uh, uh, specifically uh, disaster management and those of us who are uh, young enough would remember when we had our regional disaster uh, organization with SEDERA Caribbean Disaster Emergency Response Agency. It's now changed to SEDEMA, uh, Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. And one of their big programs, one of their focus areas, is what they call disaster risk reduction. How do you prevent injury? How do you prevent loss of life, loss of property? And that basically, when you're dealing with weather-related disasters, is what climate change adaptation is about. So the two groups are moving to a situation where we are collaborating. All right, one more question and then I'll be it. So I'm interested in knowing the nature of the campaign that you would be embarking on in the, in the weeks and months to come. Well, as, as I said in my remarks, this is, this is the beginning to get the process rolling. And June is celebrated as Environmental Month. And so we are planning a number of activities during the month of June to not only highlight the environment, but we're going to intertwine it with the whole climate change awareness campaign. And as I said in my remarks, it will involve schools, civic organizations, and various other public relations that we are going to be dealing with as we move forward. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to the media, um, the guests that has been here today. Um, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about um, 
a climate change awareness program that the Ministry of Natural Resources and Labor um, is running. And um, thank you guys for coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.